هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون those that know and those that don't know are the evil يرفع الله الذين آمنوا منكم والذين أوتوا العلم درجات Allah raises those that seek knowledge from you raises them to, to higher degrees وقل ربي زدني علما this is a dua in the Quran Allah asks us no this is something interesting there are duas in the Quran there are special supplications that Allah wants us to recite. He says, ask me for these things. That means there are certain things that are important that Allah points them out. He says, ask me for these things. <laughs> these are the supplications of the Quran. And these are very important because Allah is asking us to ask Him for these things. Among them, وَقُلْ رَبِّ زِبْنِ عَلْمَ And say, my Lord, increase my knowledge. Which other faith, which other religion emphasizes so much on seeking an education and seeking knowledge? None. Look in Christianity, look in Judaism, look in Buddhism, look in all other religions. There's no emphasis whatsoever. In Islam there is. But what's ironic is that no matter how much emphasis there is on seeking knowledge and seeking an education, Muslims are still there. You look at Western societies, in our communities, the students that get the poorest grades are the Muslim students. Or the ones that do the, the most terrible in school are the Muslim students. And those that are at the top in their class and in their university, they're not the Muslim kids. And if there are some Muslim kids, they're a minority, they're a handful. You can count them by your fingers. They're a very small number. Well, what, what happened to this emphasis on seeking knowledge? Why aren't some students paying attention to their grades? Why aren't they paying attention to their studies? Why is it their education their number one priority? My dear brothers and sisters, if you are students, and I can guess that the vast majority of you, mashallah, your students, your studies should be your number one priority. Because I can guarantee you, if you don't study now, and if you don't become successful in your studies, wallah, you will regret it one day. One day will come that you will regret it. You will say, why did I waste my time? I had an opportunity. I wish I can go back to school I wish I could go back to university and get that degree that I wanted. They will come over, brother. Knowledge for you is power. Knowledge is what will make you successful. Your studies will, will, is what will give you a bright future, nothing else other than your studies. That will bring you as advancement and success and happiness to your life. It's your education. That's it's worth it. It's worth Spending time on education. It's worth not going out with friends and spending boring days at home or in the library studying. It's worth living in other cities far away from home, far away from family to study. It's worth getting loans and not spending money on other things but spending it on education, getting loans. This is all worth it. Because this will pay off in the future. And this is the only way of seeking knowledge, brothers and sisters. Seeking knowledge has its difficulty. Knowledge does not come easy. Knowledge doesn't come and knock at your door and says, take me. Knowledge has a cost. Knowledge has a price. You have to earn it. You have to work hard for it. There's sleepless nights. Woman, Taliban, Huna, Sahaman, Bayani. You want to become someone? You want to be successful? You want to become someone that will that people will be talking about for years? It takes sleepless nights. This requires endless efforts. This requires taking out time from from your leisure time, from playing, from socializing, and spending it on studies. And Hadith Qudsi, listen to this hadith, it's beautiful. Hadith Qudsi, meaning this is directly from Allah. This is not a Quran. 
but it's among the sayings of Allah. إِنِّي جَعَلْتُ الْعَلْمَ فِي الْجُوعِ وَالنَّاسِ يَطْلَبُونَهُ فِي الشَّبَعِ People are looking, I have put knowledge in hunger. Meaning, going into debt. Meaning, getting loans. Meaning, going into knowledge, seeking knowledge, getting an education will cost you, will come at a financial price. People think that they can get it for free. People think that they'll be fine financially, they don't need to spend, and they can receive knowledge. No. وَإِنِّي جَعَلْتُ الْعِلْمَ فِي التعب والناس في الراحة. And I have put seeking knowledge and education in hardship, while people look for it at ease and at comfort. They think that if they remain at home, eating their mother's food, spending time in their bedroom, being very comfortable, knowledge is going to come to them easily. No. Allah says, إِنِّي جَعَلْتُ الْعِلْمَ فِي التعب. You have to work hard. Your body has to be physically tired. وَإِنِّي جَعَلْتُ الْعِلْمَ فِي الْغُرْبَ وَالنَّاسِ اطْلَبُونَهُ فِي الْوَطَنِ and I have put knowledge and education in a far place. You have to go and seek it. You have to leave. Leave your family. Leave your friends. Leave your comfort zone. Where you're comfortable in, you have to leave it. In order to receive knowledge. Knowledge doesn't come to you comfortably. When and people think that if they remain at home comfortably with their family, with their friends, in their comfort zone, knowledge is going to come. No, knowledge doesn't come. I remember when I was in Berkeley, 40%, 40% of the students were Asians from Japan, China, Taiwan, Korea. 40% of this university, which is which was back then, it was the United, it was the top university, public university in the United States of America. It was ranked as the top public university. 40% of the students were Asians. And I would remember the library would always be packed with Asian students. And you would never see them in parties, you would never see them Friday nights or Saturday nights, going to bars or going to pubs, never. And I wondered that these guys, their religion is what? Most of them are Buddhists. Many of them are Buddhists. And Buddhism doesn't teach people to go and see Taliban. Buddhism doesn't encourage people to get, a, to get an education. The first word that was revealed in Buddhism was not Iqra. This wasn't Islam. Salah ala Muhammad. Allah. Salah ala Muhammad. My advice to my brothers and sisters to concentrate on their time, not to lose their time, not to waste their time. Every moment that passes by is a moment lost and it will never come back but to concentrate on their education. Three points. Number one, my dear brothers and sisters, I would like for my, for my friends and my brothers and sisters listening to me to apply to the best universities. Don't apply to the average universities, to any university. Apply to the best universities in the nation. I just know two, Oxford and Cambridge. I'm sure you know others that I'm not aware of. I apply to the best universities in your city. It doesn't necessarily need to be in your city, in the country. It doesn't necessarily need to be in your country. If there's an excellent university in Paris, go to Paris. If there's good universities in America, go to America. Seek a good education at top universities. It really frustrates me when I see that some of our youth, they're satisfied with average universities. Why? in the United States of America, go to the top universities like, like Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Princeton, Berkeley, other universities. Most of these universities are packed with Jewish students. Because Jewish students are taught not to go to regular universities. Never. Ever since their kids, their parents tell them, you will apply to Ivy Leagues like Harvard and MIT, and Yale, and Stanford. 
In Los Angeles, there was a top university called UCLA. Maybe you, some of you have heard of it. The University of California, Los Angeles. UCLA. Some students would call it UCLA. That's the amount of Jews it has. And I, I look at them with envy. I say, I wish that our students were like, our youth were like this. They were as ambitious as Jewish youth. They have seriously invaded the top universities in America. I don't know about here. I'm pretty sure that it's the same thing. Go for top universities, number one. Number two, be unique. You should be unique. You don't have to copy others. We have a tendency in our community that if our kids do not become either a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer, they're not successful. You have to choose out of these three professions. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created only these three professions and there's nothing else. Why? There's so many fields out there. Be unique. I know people think the same. Remember the word hammer? People do think the same, but you be unique. Choose another field. Choose something that you like. Don't go, don't follow the status quo. Just because people see doctors as successful, it doesn't mean that you can't be successful in any other field. Or lawyers as successful or engineers. There are other fields. Go out. See what you like. See what you enjoy. A lot of you, they come and ask me, say, what do you think I should major in university? The first thing I tell them is, what do you like? What are you good at? It doesn't matter what I think. It matters what you like and what you're good at. Because if you go in a field that you don't like, believe me, you won't become successful. When you wake up in the morning to go to work, you have to enjoy waking, waking up in the morning to go to that work. Not because you're forced. Not because your mom and dad think that that makes you successful. You have to feel, feel successful. No one else can make you feel successful. There's so many fields out there. And we are in need of youth going into those fields. Like journalism. Like filmmaking and movie making. Like politics, political science. How many youth have thought of going into journalism and writing for top newspapers? Or into movie making and filmmaking? This, we are in high demand of this. How many movies are there that trash Islam and are against Islam? There are so many movies. But how many movies do we have that support Islam? That give a good image of Islam? Maybe one or two. We don't. Well, if we don't care, who else, is, who else cares? We expect from the Sikh community to come and make a good movie about Islam? If we don't care ourselves, who cares? Thus, there are so many fields to go into. For example, Islamic studies. In the United States of America, and I think here as well, the professors and teachers at the top universities that teach Islamic studies, most of them are Jewish. Can you believe this? The teachers of Islamic studies are Jewish. And the teachers that actually, te that are Muslim, that teach Islamic studies, are no more than 10 or 15. This is ridiculous. Why do we have to have other people come and teach about our religion in an academic format? Why do we have, why do we need to have Jews to come and teach about Islam? Why do we need to have people like Bernard Lewis and Samuel Huntington, who wrote his very, very famous book, The Clash of Civilizations, to come and teach about Islam? These Orientalists who come with a negative opinion of Islam, they'll come and they want to teach people about Islam. What do you think they want to teach people about Islam? Why don't we have our youth come and major in Islamic studies and become professors of Islamic studies in the top universities? This is two. Number three. I encourage my dear brothers and sisters to go for higher education as well. Don't be satisfied with a bachelor's degree. A bachelor's degree now is nothing. It's nothing. It's almost equivalent to a high school degree a couple of years back. 
Bashful Zuri is nothing. Everyone now cares of Bashful Zuri. Go for our higher education. Go for your master's. Go for your PhD. Most of you are bright. And you can do it. And you're young. Right now you're young. Many of you are single. Most of you don't have children. You don't have that many responsibilities. Believe me, you think right now you, when you're single you have responsibilities? Wait until you get married. Wait until you have children. Wait until you have to work and you have a family to look after. When that time comes, the opportunity is gone. In tahiz or faras, fa'inna tamarru marrat, sahab. Take advantage of opportunities because the opportunities will come and pass by like clouds. Before you know it, you will see that you cannot go back for your masters. You can't go and do your PhD. Time is over. I remember I have a friend who did his bachelor's and master's in biochemistry. And then he got married and has kids. And I keep on, time and time again, I keep on hearing him say, I regret not doing my PhD. Now I can't do it. I can't go back. I have a wife, I have kids, I need to work, I need to make a living for my family. There's no way I could go back and do a PhD and get a loan. If you have the opportunity, if you have the time, if you have the potential, don't let it go to waste, my dear brothers and sisters. Take advantage of this. Go for higher education. Don't be hesitant. If some of you had the idea and were hesitant, I'm telling you now, don't be hesitant. Tonight, go and apply. Tonight, after you finish, you go back home, go on Google and start searching for university stuff like that. So I'm going to come in this is one point. Another point that I've witnessed and I'd like to bring to your attention, my dear brothers and sisters, and my dear friends, is that many of our youth not only neglect their secular education, but they neglect their religious education as well. They don't learn about their faith. They don't learn about their religion. There was a coin, and there was a term coined just a few years ago. Some youth were called 40 day Muslims, 10 days of Muharram, and 30 days of Ramadan put together, 40 days, 40 day Muslims. I say, no, if they're 40 day Muslims, this is good. I call them 13 day Muslims. The 10 days of Muharram and 3 nights of Yadi al not even Ramadan. Our youth are missing in the Majalis of Allah. Only the three nights of Ghazi Qadr. Many of our youth are 13 day Muslims. For 13 days you see them, and then throughout the year, they disappear. You don't see them. And these lectures are not enough. You think that you can learn all about your faith within 10 lectures? This is nothing. Our youth don't go and seek a religious education. They don't read. They don't read Islamic books. Very few, a very mi small minority that actually pick up Islamic books and they read. Or listen to lectures. The vast majority, they depend on the ten nights of Muharram for their religious education. And this is wrong. This is wrong. The problem is that right now, if you don't seek your religious education, you don't, you don't learn about what is halal, what is haram, you will get yourself in a mess you will get yourself in a mess. Only years after, when you've gotten married and you have kids of your own, and then you feel that the need to receive a religious education and learn, all of a sudden you discover that for the past 10 years of your life, all of your salat is bothered. Because you were doing something wrong. Or your wudu is bothered. Or your hajj was bothered. After 10 years you want to discover this and you want to do it all over? Hawaii, learn about it now. Learn about the laws of your salah now, the laws of wudu, the laws of hajj, the laws of halal food, the laws of whatever. Learn about it now. <coughs> On the day of judgment, there's a hadith that we will be held accountable. One hadith will say, Halla amilt. Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? Didn't you know this was haram? Didn't you know this was wajib? The answer, we will answer, Lam kunta 
I didn't know, I didn't have knowledge. The answer will come to us, and la ta'allam. Why didn't you go learn? There were so many sources available, so many lectures online, so many English books. They're easy reads. They're very easy reads. Just go Google them and look for books. Ignorance is not an excuse, brothers and sisters. Unfortunately, our youth, they don't read, they don't learn. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, لَوْ أَتَيْتُ بِشَابٍ لَوْ أُتِيَ بِي شَابٍ مِنْ شَبَابِ الشِّيعَةِ لَا يَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينَ لَأَدَّبْتُهُ If one of the youth of the Shia comes to me and I discover that he's not learning about his faith and about his religion, I will teach him a lesson. I will discipline him. Our youth don't learn. And allow me to say this, and I hope I'm not offending anyone. Take this as, a, as an older brother or a younger brother, whatever you want to consider me. Our youth don't learn. And you know what's the prime example? The prime example is when we have Q&A sessions from the questions. It's very evident that our youth are not religiously educated. Because we get the same exact questions every time. And questions like what? Say, is music halal? Say, are tattoos permissible? These are the most important two questions that we get every time. Music and tattoos. Tell us, Islam is condensed to tattoos and music? This is all you want to know about your faith and about your religion? And you abandon everything else? No, my dear. Learn. Learn about your faith. Learn about your religion. One of the scholars, one of the Muslim scholars in the United States of America wrote his memoirs. He wrote it in Arabic. And the book is called Ashamsu Tishrak Omiran Dhabu. The sun rises from the west. It's a very beautiful book. It's in Arabic. And it's about the memoirs of this religious Muslim, Shi'i, religious scholar in the West. And he talks about his experience with the youth, with the Muslim community, how he migrated to America, and the problems of society. He mentions that once he was on a plane, someone was sitting next to him. He said, I started speaking to this young man. He said, when I started talking to him, he told me that I come from such and such country. That country is an Islamic country. He said, so I told him, oh, so you're Muslim. He said, yes, I'm Muslim, but I don't know anything about Islam other than the Ten Commandments. <laughs> the Ten Commandments are in Judaism and Christianity. He says, I don't know anything about Islam other than the Ten Commandments. Some of our youth are like this. They barely know anything about their faith. They barely know anything about their history, about their religion, about their laws. The same scholar, he mentions another story. He says that once I was asked to go to another state to perform Salat al janazah over a dead body. And in that state, in that city, there were no Muslim scholars. So they called me, I had to take a plane, go over there, and recite Salat al janazah and give a short speech. He said, I went, I walked inside the masjid. He said, men and women were sitting inside the masjid. The women were dressed so bad that he thought I walked into a bar, not a masjid. So he said, I walked out thinking that I walked in the wrong place. He told me, no, you're in, you're in the right place. This is the funeral. He said, I walked in and the fatah has started and there were a few lectures, there were eulogies. The lady who had died, her son got up to give a speech. He said, he stood up, and he said, after saying his salam, and thanking everyone for coming to the funeral, he said, today, I have mixed feelings. Today, I am sad, and I am happy at the same time. I have mixed feelings. I am sad because my mother has passed away, and I am at her funeral. And I am happy because today is my wife's birthday. Wow. This is at his mother's funeral. And then the scholar in his memoirs, he said that he started saying jokes about his mother. My mother used to do this, my mother started, used to do that, and people were laughing in her funeral. After that, he said, we went to the cemetery. We were about to bury, he said, I recited salah, 
And I was the only person that stood for salah. No one else came. He said, when we went to bury the body, I noticed that the grave is not towards the qibla. The grave has to be towards the qibla. If the qibla is like this, the body has to be put in this direction. Head this way, feet that way, the face, the face facing the qibla. He said, I saw that the grave is not facing the qibla. I told him, this is wrong. This is wrong. The grave has to be facing the qibla. He said, the daughter of the lady, she came and said, Sidi, what are you talking about? Do you think God doesn't have any other thing but to worry about the grave of my mother, whether it's facing the qibla or not? He said, when I saw this, I left. I left because I do not want to participate in any sort of burial, in an un-Islamic burial, with me being there. This is what happens, my dear friends. When a certain society, a certain community doesn't learn about faith, they don't go and ask, they don't go read, they don't listen to lectures, they're so far away from faith, this is what happens. This is what happens to their dead. This is what happens to their living. And to me, these people are called living. But to me, these people are dead, but they're walking. A person without faith and without religion, this person is as good as dead. And the same scholar also mentions in his memoirs, he said, once I was giving lectures about Hajj, and I was telling people in my audience that if you've wronged someone, if you've done something wrong to someone, you have to go and seek forgiveness. If you've stolen, if you've borrowed, if you've taken something from someone, you have to return it. Because when you go to Hajj, you have to be pure and clean. So he said, the next day, some lady came in and she said, a few years back I stole a watch from a lady. But I'm embarrassed to give it to her. I will give you her phone number. Please call her and tell her to come to her. And don't give her money. This saint said, okay. He took the phone number and he called that lady. He said, there's a watch that was stolen from you. The person who stole it from you has brought it back to the pick He said, the next day the lady came in with her husband. She was, she was old. And she wasn't young. She was probably in her 50s. She came, she picked up the watch, she thanked me, and she was about to leave. All of a sudden, as soon as she left, she came back. She said, see, I remember you. As long as I'm here in your office, I have a favor to ask. He said, yes. He said, me and, she said, me and my husband, when we got married, we got married in the court system. We never performed the happen. He said, when was this? She said, 28 years ago. And we have five kids now and seven grandchildren. And they hadn't performed the Akhid. Can you do us a favor and perform the Akhid for us now? He said, yeah, sure, but you're 28 years late. You performed the Akhid. This, this happens. This happens when you don't read. You might think this will never happen to me. Well, this might not happen to you. But something else will. Read, my dear friends. Read about your faith. Study. Salah ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa sallam. Our scholars would go through so much difficulties just to migrate to Najaf or home to study about their faith, to study about their religion. Read about the difficulties and challenges that our scholars face in order to seek a religious education. They face very difficult times. Very hard times. They lived, they lived off of loans. There's a scholar by the name of Ochani. He's from Iran. He migrated to Najaf. He also wrote his memoirs. He said that when I came to Najaf, I was so poor, my father stopped sending me money. After a while, he would send me, he would send me maybe, what was it, equivalent to $50 a month. And then after a while, he stopped sending me. After several months, maybe after a year, I received a letter from my father. He said, as soon as I saw that it's from my father, I got really happy, thinking that he sent me money. I opened it, there was no money, but there was a note. There was a letter. From my father to me. He said, I started reading it. And I noticed that my father is asking me for some money. His father was asking him for some money. <coughs> Our scholars went through difficult times just to migrate to Najaf to learn and to study. 
can we just pick up a couple of books to read about our faith? And by the way, brothers and sisters, and especially for the brothers, I encourage you, I encourage some of you, for those of you that are interested, and for those of you that have the passion for this, to come and study at the Islamic Seminary in Najaf and Kamala. If you have a passion for Islamic studies, if you have a passion to become a scholar or a speaker, to call people to Islam and the school of Tarb al Bayt, I encourage you to come. Come. Come to Najaf. Come to Kamala. Come and study. You don't need to spend 20 years. You don't need to spend 30 years. You can come for two years, three years, four years, however much you feel comfortable. Come, there's an opportunity. And there's many classes, and there's many schools. And even for the sisters, I've heard that now in Najaf there are schools accommodating for young ladies as well. They can come in and study for several months, for several years. And for those of you that are interested, I can be of assistance, come speak to me, I can help. I can help on this. If you'd like to come to Karbala specifically, I can help. Come and study. We are in need of scholars. The West is in need of scholars. Our communities are in need of English speaking. Ulama, they're on demand. You can see right now. English speaking scholars and speakers are probably a handful, no more. Those that speak Arabic, mashallah. But those that speak English are limited. If you have a passion, Come, and Allah will help you, inshaAllah. Salaam alaykum. Allahumma salaam alaykum. Allahumma salaam alaykum. A third point. And this is also something that I've noticed. Our youth lack ambition. Our youth are not ambitious. You see, many of our youth, they're satisfied with this ordinary school that they go to and the ordinary paying job that they have, and that's it. As long as they're paying their bills, as long as at the end of the month, they can pay off the bills at the shisha place, and they get what they want, and they can buy the shoes that they want, call us, this is it. This is wrong. Our youth need to be ambitious. They lack ambition. They have no goals and objectives, big goals and big objectives. We don't. You might say, but Sayyidina, doesn't Islam tell us to be satisfied? Doesn't Islam say Al-Qana'atu Kenzun La Yifna? That to be satisfied with yourself and who you are and what you have, this is something good? I say yes, this is something good. To be satisfied financially, to be satisfied materialistically, this is correct. People should not be greedy. People should not be looking out for money from the morning till night. But at the same time, they should be ambitious. They should want to be successful. They should not be satisfied with ordinary jobs and with an ordinary education and with an ordinary salary. If you have the potential to be better than who you are, do it. Most of us, brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, most of us only carry out 10% of our potential. 10% of our potential. We can be greater, 10 times greater than the person that we are right now. Educationally, spiritually, religiously, job-wise. But our youth like ambition. Allah one day taught Prophet Ibrahim a great lesson. Ibrahim salam one day, after building the Kaaba, Ibrahim built the Kaaba. After building the Kaaba, him and his son Ismail, Ibrahim removed the dust off his hand. He leaned against, he leaned back on the Kaaba. He said, Alhamdulillah. Allah told him, What are you thinking of me for? What is this Alhamdulillah for? He said, Ilahi, Baneetu Baytu. I built your house. This house that millions of people are going to come and visit. I built it. Shouldn't I be proud? Shouldn't I be happy? Allah tells him, O oh, Ibrahim, هل كسوت عريانا وهل أطعمت جاهنا? What is it that you did? إنما وضعت حجر على حجر. Did you feed the needy? Were there people without clothing? You gave them clothing? What is it that you did? All you did was put bricks over bricks. 
And you say, Alhamdulillah, as if this is a magnificent accomplishment. This is nothing. Allah is giving Ibrahim a lesson. Be ambitious. Don't think that if you built a small house, you should feel successful. What about the people? What about serving the people? You should be more ambitious than that. خَيْرُ nas مَنْ نَفَعَ nas. The best, the best people are those that serve people. This is a criteria. Not which family you come from, not which social status, but what is, what is it that you do? What is it that you offer? How much is it that you contribute to people and to your community and your society? Remember this. خَيْرُ nas مَنْ نَفَعَ nas. I advise my brothers and sisters to be ambitious. Have high goals and ambitions. Have high ab objectives. The president, the current president of the United States of America, Barack Obama, number one, he's black. There was no other black president in the United States of America. And you know how in some countries they're racist, especially against black people. They're racist. And not only is he black, but his father is a Muslim. Two minorities. He comes from two minorities. He's black and his father was a Muslim. Yet he reached the White House. If you were to sit back and say, no, I'm fine working at a law firm as a lawyer, or I'm fine being a congressman or a senator, he wouldn't have reached the White House. But because he was ambitious. The Jews, the Jews in the world, they have a country for the past several decades, they have a country. But the Jews here in Europe, they were persecuted for centuries. Read about the history of Jews here in Europe. For hundreds of years, Jews were persecuted in Poland, in Germany, in the UK, in other places they were persecuted. But all of a sudden things changed for the Jews. All of a sudden they said, enough is enough, we need our own country. And they went and they took a country that belonged to someone else and they established their own country. Because they have ambition. Our youth lack ambition. They lack goals. They think small. They don't think big. They think on a personal scale. They don't think on a global scale. Think large, my dear brothers and sisters, in any field that you go in. You go into business. You go into business, make your business the most successful business. Make it into a world corporation. Have stores all across the world. There's nothing wrong with that. Islam doesn't say have a small store that can barely feed your family. No, become a successful businessman. If you go into politics, and you go into pol if you become politicians, become the most successful politician. Islam doesn't hold you back. Let's learn from others. Let's learn from the experience of, from, of others. And let's be motivated by others. Look at the founders of Facebook. And the founders of Google. And the founder of Apple. These people started small, yet they thought big. The beginning was small, but their outlook was big. They had big ambitions. They had big goals. They had big objectives. And they reached. The founder of Apple, Steve Jobs, or Steve Jobs. Is it Steve Jobs or Jobs? Jobs. 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 <laughs> if you read about his history and about his background, he was an orphan. Or he was like an orphan. His father abandoned him. His father, who by the way was a Muslim, I believe, he abandoned him. He left him and he left his mother. He grew up by himself. And then they... He, um, they adopted him. Another family adopted him. He lived a very difficult life. A very harsh life. Yet, he became successful. He became one of the most important men in our century. Maybe one of the most important men in our lifetime. And we lost him. People like this, who serve humanity, I feel these people should be honored. I would like to see some of our youth that would think this way. If you have an idea, think big, make it big. We need more successful people in our communities, my dear brothers and sisters. I remember once I went to visit one of our Malajah, he knew me and he knew my father. 
when I sat and had a private discussion with him, he told me, how, how old are you? So I told him my age, which I'm not going to repeat now. <laughs> he said, your father, and he was a good friend of my father. He said, your father. Oh, by the way, he said, how many people want to kill you? <laughs> well, my woman, I don't get it. What do you mean, how many people want to kill me? He said, ask me, is there anyone that wants to kill you? Well, I mean, uh, well, when I annoy her, my wife wants to kill me sometimes. Does that count? He said, is there someone that wants to kill me? I told him, no. He said, your father, when he was your age, there were people that wanted to kill him. He needed bodyguards when he was your age. His beard was fully black. Why? Because he was ambitious. He would stand in the haram of Imam Hussein and he would speak against Al-Hizb al-Shiyuri, the Communist Party, at the time of Abdul Karim Qasim. And he spoke, he would speak, he would address current issues, political issues. He had ambitions, and people knew him in Iraq. At your age, everyone in Iraq knew him. So from that day on, I thought of how to become successful, make a collection of people that want to kill him. <laughs> Let's think ambitious for brothers and sisters. Let's think big. And number four, our youth and many of them, and forgive me for making generalizations, but I'd like to do something. I mean, I'd like to get something into you. I'd like to motivate you to, to move and act. Many of our youth are lazy. They're inactive. They hear about a majlis, okay, we'll go and attend the majlis. But have you ever thought of holding your own majlis? Have you ever thought of volunteering at that majlis? Or are you always used to going to a majlis? Everything is prepared. There's already volunteers. Everything is set up. And you just go and attend. And you enjoy yourself and you listen to a lecture. And you leave and that's it. This is not right. This is not right. Our youth need to become involved and active. They need to go and ask which religious organizations are in need of volunteers? <laughs> which religious organizations are in need of help? I get really disappointed when I hear of youth working for other sort of organizations, especially other sort of religious organizations that are not Muslim, and they abandon religious organizations, Islamic organizations. Isn't this ridiculous? Your organizations and foundations, they need your support. If you can't help financially, some of you might help financially, help financially. If you can't help financially, help with your time. Help with your efforts. Volunteer from time to time. Go and see this sort of organization, this assignment center might need volunteers. Go and ask. If you have a couple of time, a, a couple of hours free during the week, go and volunteer. This is the best act that you can do. But fortunately, most of us know we're not used to that. We're used to being served. We're not used to serving. Remember, The best people are no, not those that get served. The ones that serve themselves. This is your faith, brothers and sisters. This is your religion. Work for it. Work for it in dedication. Devote some time. Be active. You take the initiative. You go and volunteer. Don't have people come and beg you. Don't have, come, don't have people come stand behind the podiums, grab the microphone, and beg you for some of your time. You take the initiative. You feel the responsibility. You have to feel responsible for these things. All of us are responsible. How do you think this religion came to us, brothers and sisters? How did this faith reach us? Because people were lazy, they sat back, they sat back at home, relaxed, and they slept all day and all night. And this faith reached us? This faith reached us because of sacrifices. Because people sacrificed their lives. They sacrificed their blood, they sacrificed their, their children and their wealth for this faith to reach you. You are not asked to sacrifice your life. No one's asking you to sacrifice your blood and to sacrifice your children. No. But you're asked to sacrifice a bit of your time. To volunteer some of your time. Because this is your faith. The same way that it reached you, it is your job to pass it on to further generations. Starting with your children. 
and the future, inshallah. You begin with your children and you pass on this faith the same way that it reached you. This is how you show your gratitude to Allah. We are all grateful to be fathers of Ahl Bayt. Are we not? All of us are grateful. How do we show our gratefulness to Allah? We pass this message on to others. And it doesn't happen by being lazy, by being inactive, by having people come and beg us to participate. We take the initiative. And at the same time, allow me to say this. <laughs> I must also say this to the elders of our community. Give the chance to our youth to come and work. Unfortunately, in some communities, the elders, they don't give an opportunity for the youth to take the initiative. They're not encouraged. We don't encourage our youth to a certain degree. Not only, not only in some communities do we not encourage, we discourage. If we see a group of youth that are working, that are contributing, that, are, that want to hold something, that want to hold an event, we discourage them. We tell them, Baba, what are you doing? This is our job, not your job. Is this the right way to encourage our group? Our elders need to be encouraging, they need to be welcoming. Sometimes, sometimes they need to step aside and give room for the younger generation. Because our old patterns don't work anymore. We need new minds. We need new tactics. We need new ideas. Let's give room for the younger generations to come Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, before he migrated from Mecca to Yathrib to Medina, he sat for the moon. Mus'ab ibn Umayr. Mus'ab ibn Umayr was in his 20s. He sent him a youth, a young man, to go and prepare the city of Medina, the city of Yathrib, for the migration of Rasulullah. He sent a youth. Even though Rasulullah had old companions. He had companions with white beards and gray beards. And he sent Mus'ab ibn Umayr to teach them Quran and to, to pray salat al jamaah to lead them to salat. After the conquest of Mecca, Fatah Mecca, Rasulullah didn't settle in Mecca. He remained in Medina, yet he sent them a young man by the name of I forgot. But it was a young man. Anyhow, he was 21 years old. One of his Sahaba, he was 21 years old. He sent him to Mecca, and Mecca moved. Quraysh is in Mecca. His enemies were in Mecca, those who fought him for so many years. He sends a young man. Something Ibn Usayd. I forgot his first name. What? No, not the son. Not the son. I'll get to it. That's my third example. Something Ibn Abu Sayyid, he was 21 years old, he would pray jama'ah in Masjid al Haram. And the people of Quraysh would pray behind him. And he became Rasulullah's dignitary in Mecca. And as for Usama bin Zayd, Usama bin Zayd was 17 years old, Rasulullah makes him the head of an army. And he orders the top Sahaba to be under his guidance and leadership. Is that this an example? Shouldn't we learn from Rasulullah? That we should give room and give an opportunity for our youth to come and work? We should encourage them? And Rasulullah was narrated saying, أُوصِيكُمْ بِالشَّبَابِ خَيْرًا فَإِنَّهُمْ أَرَقُّ أَفْئِدَةً أن الله أرسلني بشيرا ونذيرا فحالفني الشباب وخالفني الشيوخ. He says, he tells his companions, take care of the youth. Give them attention. Don't marginalize them. Don't put them in a corner and marginalize them. No. Give them room. Give them an opportunity. Give them a chance to come and work. When Allah sent me a messenger, my first followers, Rasulullah says, my first followers were youth. And it was the elders of Quraysh who fought me and waged the war against me. And it was the youth of Quraysh that followed Rasulullah. Why do you think Quraysh even fought Rasulullah? Quraysh comes to Abu Talib, they tell me, Ya Abu Talib, Inna ibn Akhik, Afsada Shababana. 
Your nephew has corrupted our youth. We are worried about your youth. فَقُلْنَهُ إِنْ أَرَادَ مِلْكًا مَلَّكْنَاهُ وَإِنْ أَرَادَ زُوْجَةً زُوْجْنَاهُ Tell him if he wants to become a king, we'll make him a king. If he wants a wife, we'll make him, we'll give him a wife. Just tell him to leave this religion, leave this whole nonsense. Abu Talib comes to Rasulullah and he gives him this message. Rasulullah said his famous quote: "Wallah ya am, in wallah al-shams fi yamini, wal-qamar fi shimali, ala an atwak hada al-amr, ma faalt, hatta amu tawasabu." That if they put the sun in my right hand. And the moon, not a king. Make me a king, give me a wife. If they put the moon, if they put the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left hand to leave this message, I would know. The whole point of finding Rasulullah was because those who followed him were youth. Rasulullah <coughs> would pay attention to the youth. He would concentrate on the youth. Yet unfortunately there are some that belittle the youth. They think that they don't they don't have competence. They don't have the capability and potential to take on responsibility. They say that one day, a group of men went to visit one of the Khulafa. They went to visit one of the Khulafa. This, this group of men were headed by, by a youth. When the Khalifa, he saw this group of, this group of men approach him, headed by a young, by a young man, he'd be a little man. He didn't take them seriously. He looked at the young man, he told him, how, are you? how old are you, my dear son? He told him, my age is the same age as Usama bin Zayd when Rasulullah sent him as a commander of the army. We didn't go and be a little bit. We think you, won't, you don't want to take me seriously. I'm 17. Usama bin Zayd was also 17. And Rasulullah made them the, the, the commander of the army. Incidentally, Abu Bakr, the Khalifa Abu Bakr, his father asked him, he told him, why, why did you take the Khilafah for yourself? Even though you know that Ali ibn Abi Talib is the right person for the Khilafah. He told him, because I'm older. Ali ibn Abi Talib is only 33 years old. And I'm an old man. I'm older. He said, if age has something to do with it, then I, your father, I have to become the Khilafah. Okay. If it's about age, then I should be the Khilafah. That's what pay attention to our youth. Imam Hassan al Mushtaba will tell his children, Inna kum salaru qawmi, Inna kum al-yawm salaru qawmi, wa ghadan kibaru qawmi akhareen. Today you are young. You are the young people of a community, but tomorrow you will be the big people of another community. He would teach his youth. He would teach his children how to develop religious skills, uh, I'm sorry, leadership skills. And when we look at Ashura, when we come to Karbala, we see that the revolution of Karbala could not have taken place without the youth of Ashura, the youth of Karbala. Karbala was full of youth. You look at Al Qasim and his brothers. You look at Al Abbas. Abdul I mean, Abbas was in his 30s. He was only in his 30s. When you, when you think of the name Abdul Fulul Abbas, you imagine an old man. Abu Talib Abbas was in his 30s. He was 33 or 34. Wahab and Ali ibn al-Akhla. These were the youth of Ashura. If it wasn't for these youth, Ashura would not have been Ashura. And Karbala would not have been Karbala. Most of the companions of Imam Hussein, they were young. They were youth. Yet they were willing to sacrifice their life for Islam. They were willing to sacrifice their life for Imam Hussein and for the cause of Imam Hussein. Imam Sadiq salam in his ziyarah towards the Sahaba, when he comes and he visits the Sahaba of Imam Hussein, this is how he addresses them. And Imam Sadiq is an Imam. He says, Bi May my mother and father be a sacrifice for you. Bi Abi Antum wa Ummi Tiftum wa Tabat al Awulati fiha Bifantum. You have been purified and the land that you are buried in has been purified. One of the companions of Imam Hussein, one of the youth,
stands in the, in the middle of the battlefield, he fights, and he stands and he exposes his chest. There were arrows coming towards him without, <coughs> without carrying a shield. They told him, are you insane? Are you insane? Are you insane for standing in the battlefield, exposing your chest? Perhaps some arrows would come and pierce through your chest? He says, yes, I am insane. Indeed, I have become insane. And the Prophet Hussein, a gentleman. The love of Hussein has made me insane. The love of Hussein has reached, has made me reach the point of insanity. These were the youth of Ashura. And the first among Bani Hashim to enter the battlefield was Ali al-Akbar. The, the eldest son of Imam Hussein. Imam Hussein started with his family, and when he started with his family, he started from his own son. Imam Hussein gives an example. When you start a revolution, you begin with yourself, and when you begin with your family. One day, Imam Hussein was in the Masjid of Rasulullah. A man comes to him, and he tells him, Ya Rasulullah, I saw your grandfather in my dream. And he told me such and such. It's a long story. I saw your grandfather. He told him, are you sure you saw my grandfather? And he said, yes. He said, if you see someone that looks like him, would you be able to recognize him? He said, yes. All of a sudden, Ali al-Akbar entered the masjid. He said, look at this young man. The man was baffled. He saw Ali al-Akbar. He said, you have no Rasulullah. It's as if this is Rasulullah. He looks exactly like Rasulullah. When Ali al-Akbar came to seek permission to enter the battlefield, historians say that this was the only time that Imam Hussein did not refuse. When Abu al-Fadl asked for permission, he refused. When al basim asked for permission, he refused. When some of the companions asked for permission, he kept on refusing. But when his own son sought permission, he did not refuse. All he did was he started weeping, his tears came down his cheeks. He looked to the sky and he said, Allahumma shad ala ha'ula in thom. Faqad baraza ilayhim ghulamun ashbahu al-naz khalqan wa khuluqan wa mantqan bi rasulik. Wa kunna ala ishtabna ila nabiyik nadarna ila wajhi hadal ghulam. Oh Allah, bear witness on these people that a young man who is most similar to Rasulullah in his looks, in his speech, and in his demeanor has come out to fight them. And when we ever missed your Prophet, we would look at the face of this young man and we would remember your messenger. Allahumma mazzukhum tamziqa waj'alhum tara'iqa qidada Imam Hussein began to curse this group of people, asking Allah to send his wrath upon them. And then you look to Umar bin Sa'ad, he said, Ya Umar, Tada'a Allahu rahimak kama tada'ta rahimi. Wa sallatallahu alayka man yadbahuka fi firashi. Oh Umar, may Allah cut off your ties with your family members the same way you are cutting my ties with my family members. And may Allah send you someone to slaughter you on your bed. Ali al-Akbar enters the battlefield. He begins to recite, Ana Ali ibn al-Husayn ibn Ali, Alaytu an la anthani, Ahmi an ayalati abi. He began to recite, he began to fight. Scholar and historian say that Ali, Ali al-Akbar, the son of Imam Hussein, killed many of the enemies from the other side, from the camp of Umar ibn Sa'ad. Imam Hussein alayhi salam was standing. Layla, his mother, the mother of Ali Akbar, she was too afraid to look at the battlefield. She didn't want to see what is going to happen to her son. She kept on looking at the face of Imam Hussein. All of a sudden she saw that Imam Hussein became nervous. He became nervous, his face changed. She said, Sayyidi, did anything happen to my son? He said, no, nothing happened to him, but a champion has come out to fight him. I am worried about him. Go back to your tent, Layla, and pray for your son, Ali. Because the dua of a mother is accepted when she prays for her son. Layla came back in her tent. 
She took off her hijab, she raised her head, and she began reciting, Ilahi bi ghurbati Abi Abdullah. Ilahi bi ghurbati Abi Abdullah. Ilahi bi atash Abi Abdullah. يا راد يوسف إلى يعقوب رد إلي ولدي علي طبت الخيمة الغريبة وتوسلت لله بحبيبة وبالحسين وش ما بيه بمصيبة يا راد يوسف من مغيبة اليعقوب ومسجن نحيبة ريدا علي سالم تجيبة Moments later Ali Akbar came back came back to the tent he came to his father my dear father is there a drop is there any sort of way I can drink water Thirst is killing me, my dear father. I can no longer go back and fight. Thirst <coughs> has, is harming me. And my armor is too heavy for me, my dear father. Please, is there any way you can get me some water? Imam Hussein performed a gesture to Ali al-Akbar, signaling to him that I am more thirsty than you, my dear father. I am more thirsty than you, my dear son. يا بويا شربة المي الجبدي الجوا وريد للميدان وحدي يا بويا فطر جبدي وحق جدي العطش والشمس والميدان والحار علي الأكبر entered the battlefield this time without a return he began to fight the enemy soldiers surrounded surrounded him from every corner all of a sudden and as they hit him on his head he hits him he enters Ali Akbar Ali Akbar falls from his horse but the horse begins to drag him the horse does not drag him to the camp of Imam Hussein the, drag, the horse drags him to the other camp the enemy soldiers, they surround Ali al-Akbar and they begin to hit him with, it, with their swords. They cut him into pieces. Hayna al-Munadi wa Aliyya wa Mazluma. He shouts for his father, Aba Aba alayka min salam. Fahada jaddi qad saqani bi ka'sih al-awfa sharbatan la adhmahu ba'daha abada. Imam Hussein rushes to him, he comes to him, he sees his son into pieces. He puts his cheek on the he puts his cheeks on the cheeks of Ali al Akbar. My son Ali, life is not worth living after you. As for you, you have departed this life and its difficulties and its hardships and you've left your father all alone. Imam Hussain Ali salam noticed that Ali al-Akbar would smile from time to time and would cry from time to time. He told him, my dear son, why are you smiling and why are you crying? He told him, my dear father, when I look to my right, I see my grandfather has come to greet me. My grandfather, Rasulullah, has come to greet me and, she's holding a cup, and he's holding a cup of water to quench my thirst. But when I look to my left, I see my grandmother, Fatima Tizala, hitting her head. She's looking at you and she's hitting her head. Imam Hussein would always carry the soldiers back to the camp. All the time he himself would carry back the soldiers, the dead soldiers back to the camp. But now he could not carry Ali al-Akbar. That is why historians say he shouted, Ya Jubban Bani Hashim, Ali al-Khaymah. 
All the sons of Bani, Bani Hashim, come and carry your brother Ali because I don't have the energy to carry him. Ya boy, ya boy, ya gul min ul shirag rasak. Ya nor in ayan min khamad an fasak. Ya agli min silab dirak u qasak. Ya roh shlon shuf anak in tabbar. أريد بيت الدعاء أريد أمسح جروحي وشم خدك أريد أمسح جروحي وشم خدك وحط صدري على صدرك ووزدك يا كوكبا ما كان أقصر عمره وكذا تكون كواكب الأسحار يا ما يا ما سهر جفني وتعب قلب وفنية الروح تالي عيني شفت ذاك السهر من من حريك مسفوح شي صبر الأم لا لقيت نحر الإبلي 